Hello SGD Sacred Geometry Decoded and this video will be I'm going to include, I'm going to include it in the Unlocking the Giza Plateau um, series playlist because uh, it is related but also this is going to be a diversion but, but we'll be, we will be looking at the same essential elements in regards to the solstice equinox and the Egyptian New Year which was related to Arket the flood season but more importantly how it relates to the pyramid text but also the coffin and the book of the dead in regards to the opening the mouth ceremony and the orientation of these structures to the north linking through Heliopolis and Sheset and the stretching the cord ceremony links have been the playlist um, to these earlier series on Heliopolis and on Sheset and also part one of this series Great Pyramids Unlocking the Giza Plateau part one I went through the stretching of a cord ceremony with more information than I, I included in the Sheset series so you could if you're deeply interested look into the Sheset series but part one uh, Giza Pyramids Unlocking the Plateau and that will relate to this series so what is Heliopolis well it's a very small open-air museum and now it's buried underneath the uh, suburbs of Cairo. Uh, this is a map, I'll put the links, uh, so there's a site, the Heliopolis Project, they've been doing some archaeology there recently to, re to confirm some older work. For instance, uh, Petri, uh, back in 1912, did some work on Heliopolis, and, and so this is the map in, uh, from their papers, and by using these points, I've plotted it onto Google Earth to, to be able to do some of my own measurements but what we have here is the walls of Heliopolis and here as it's marked we have the sacred mound the Ben Ben mound of Heliopolis so how does this all relate well from that zero point northwest corner of Caffray Valley Temple and there's actually going to be more to come to connect Caffray Valley Temple via Siron and Heliopolis as well as uh, Sheset through these ancient sciences of Egypt but there we have the uh, a basic plan with the solstice equinox winter solstice of course that winter solstice line touches Kent Cowway's pyramid at 28 degrees south of west and then we have this green line to Menkara pyramid and the blue line to Caffray pyramid along the Caffray causeway bisecting this line between equinox and summer solstice but so 28 degrees above or 28 degrees below with 14 degrees are uh, dividing each now earlier in this uh, unlocking Giza plateau series I went through Thebes and how all of these sites uh, have this very important 28 degree alignment marking the summer solstice now what's interesting is that even south uh, such as I mentioned in Elephantine they're so far south there should be a slight little change now as best as I can measure on Google Earth um, because the angles will change as you move north or south so it's a question of uh, definitely the, the alignment is there now the accuracy are they with these tools I'm restricted to or are they actually mirroring the Giza complex of the, of the three pyramids especially Khafre and uh, Khufu or the Great Pyramid as well and also the symbolism of that when on the summer solstice the sun sets right between Khafre and the Khufu pyramid Khufu pyramid you see in profile the Khafre pyramid or the great sorry the Khafre pyramid you see in profile the great pyramid or as it's called the pyramid of Khufu you see at an angle you see it from the corners and so the angles you would see are 42 and 48 degrees but of course that is a very powerful symbol of the season of Arquette the big the flood season which begins on summer solstice the Egyptian New Year and as throughout that that series I've been talking about the importance of the annual flood cycle and why these um, would be so important to have this archaeoastronomy and symbolism joining together. Uh, Elephantine which is very very south it's almost at the uh, at the tropic uh, that too has that same angle as seen in on the three pyramids at Giza and it's also reflecting that 42 48 degree angle in its structures um, as well but that was in the earlier parts of the series I put the whole playlist in the description but back to the plateau and the, the three most in, 
are famous of these pyramids. Well, that 28 degree line, as we saw in Thebes, so the Karnak Temple, through the main alignment of the main temple itself at 28 degrees, so summer solstice sunset, or the opposite direction would be winter solstice sunrise. Now, it's important to mention Karnak, because Karnak is said to be the largest temple complex in Egypt. Well, at the moment, um, walled complex, yes. But in the past, so Heliopolis, well, Heliopolis is tilted at 14 degrees. That's a very important angle. I'll get into that in a moment. But Karnak would fit into Heliopolis, and you have you could fit it in twice uh, quite easily and then still have room left over. Heliopolis was the largest walled temple complex, not just in ancient Egypt, but the world. I think Angkor Wat is considered the largest at the moment. Well, Angkor Wat and Heli the walls of Heliopolis are almost the same. So Heliopolis was or, or the largest temple complex walled in the world. It was so, so important to ancient Egypt probably the most important site in at least Lower Egypt. I'll explain why in a moment. But that uh, 14 degree angle, but also the 28 degree angle. So back to the summer solstice, 28 degrees. So true west, 28 degrees above that is the summer solstice, where the sun goes directly in between the pyramids. That's where you see them. You would see it in profile in the sunset. And there we have those all important three, four, five triangle angles, but also the 42 degrees and the 48 degrees of the pyramid, the, the corner angle, not the slope angle, which is very, very important, especially mathematically geometric. But we have these two, and they, these two angles themselves. On, I'll get more into fut in the future, but they're loaded with information. So this 42 and 48 degree. Well, that's also reflected in the Heliopolis walls. It wasn't a five-sided complex and where we see that repeated and uh, earlier so in Thebes and Elephantine and so many other places you will see this um, as well so are they re I would say that I wouldn't it well Heliopolis is so so important but because it was destroyed the stones used to make new Cairo uh, primarily come from Heliopolis now the the casing stones of the Khafre and Great Pyramid were used, but Heliopolis was a vast temple site, and there were very few. But of the surviving blocks, uh, that's the same stone that's found in across these uh, sites in Cairo. But what's the significance of 14 degrees? Well, halfway between equinox and solstice, it would give you a 45-day warning that the flood is coming. So. Egypt lived by the Nile and it lived by the flood cycle which brought um, mud and silt and nutrients and made the land fertile otherwise it just would have been a river going through desert it's that silt and the deposits that the flood brought which made Egypt viable as a civilization and so for instance by all the towns and the, are built on mounds they're built uh, because when the flood comes if you're on the flood plain uh, no good you're going to be in big trouble and so encampments and less um, people living, doing their agriculture, livestock on the on the floodplain of the Nile would need a decent warning that it's coming. You would need to prepare. It's also the beginning of summer. So a moon and a half, you, you have the heat of summer as well. So this 45 degree angle when the sun would set, sorry, this 14 degree angle when the sun sets there, it would also probably have a, uh, I'm just uh, speculating, but also it would be it's getting so hot, so we, we need to change your work patterns. People working, stonemasons, etc. Well, it's going to be so hot this time of year. You need to probably best to go home to your family for holidays or something like that. But again, that's just speculating. But the, you know, nature dictates these things, so we're, that that would have an element. I'm not sure exactly how much, but definitely it would be something to consider. So what's so important about Heliopolis? On was another name for it. You will find the Heliopolis mentioned um, more than once in the Bible. Uh, the pyramids aren't mentioned, but Heliopolis certainly is. Well, Heliopolis or Iunu or On, as it's sometimes called. Uh, Heliopolis in Greek is city of the sun. Helio, sun, polis, city. And it had this sacred mound, and this mound was ever ever so important in ancient Egyptian mythology because it was the birthplace of the gods of the Ennead 
So Artum, primordial creation mound, he was emerged from the waters and gave birth to the gods of Yeniad. He was the first god, the father of Yeniad, god of pre- and post-existence. Now that's very important because the if you draw a diagonal through any of the three pyramids at uh, at Giza or from the corner of Khafre and the Great Pyramid, not only will they point to Heliopolis, they will point to the sacred mound. It's all important, the birthplace of the gods. Uh, I'll post this paper by Magli as well because it's been noted that the pyramids down at Abu Sur, so uh, Neferefre, Neferakare and Suhure pyramid, if you line up the corners, they also point to Heliopolis. Now they don't point to the mound, they seem to be pointing to this location which just happens to be where the recent colossal statue of Samtik, uh, the first, was unearthed. There was a large complex with multiple temples inside Heliopolis, as is described by Strabo, and uh, Herodotus even speaks of how it was the, the most learned people of Egypt were at Heliopolis. However, there are more pyramids arrayed towards Heliopolis. So I've uh, looked at so Pepi the first and the Red Pyramid, as well as uh, Men M Hat the Third Pyramid and uh, Ameni Kamau Pyramid. So we see those three, which have been identified, of course, the Giza pyramids as well. But we also have the Red Pyramid and Pepi the first, and the Ameni Kamau Pyramid and the Amen M. Hat Deferred Pyramid. These also point to, not only to Heliopolis, but they also lead us to, to the Ben Ben, the creation mound of, of Heliopolis. So, you see now, many of these major pyramids are pointing there, but of course it's mentioned in all the important, most ancient surviving texts of Egypt, and we'll come to that. Uh, important to note, and because of that, zero point plan I've been speaking of and the distances between them which I've uh, started to get into in this series well the obelisk, surviving obelisk at Heliopolis there were many many there, uh, the obelisks in Rome, New York and London and Florence all emerged from Heliopolis but they, this particular surviving one is 39 cubits 273 palms or 1092 fingers this is a very important number which will actually link the zero point to Menkaura Pyramid as well, but I'll get to that in the future. But uh, it's an open air museum, we can see in that square, and that's where the surviving obelisk of Heliopolis is. It's on the it's all important Ben Ben creation mound. So Herodotus, but also Strabo, mentions there is a noteworthy mound at the Temple of Helios or Heliopolis. Uh, Flinders Petrie and Ernest McKay did some uh, did a study there in the early 1900s as well, and at that time more of the wall was surviving and the, uh, it hadn't been overtaken by the growth of Cairo. And however, since then, so there was a recent geomorphological geophysical survey there which confirmed the existence of this mound going at back at least 4000 BC. Uh, well. Actually, three so between three and four thousand BC at least. This is where this site was being occupied, and it's very important because as one of the, the combination approach of geomorphological and geophysical surveying proved for the first time the existence of a paleo landscape marked by at least one sandy elevation rising as an island at least five point five meters above the floodplain when first settlement took place. In addition, it paved the way for the first localization of a limestone wall in the vicinity of the obelisk. In this way, it contribute greatly to debates over ancient Egypt's religious history, topics as such as the transformation of a mythical landscape into an architectural reenactment of a mythical past can be addressed anew. So in the previous episodes, I also went into how the pyramids at the Great Pyramid, Khufu Pyramid, Kankawa and the Sphinx were actually natural elements which were expanded upon and this natural mythological beginnings would become an architectural reenactment of the mythic past. So that's another example of this and there's more to be said. But So the Egyptian creation story, uh, there's 
Upper versus Lower Egypt, there are similarity, similarity. In Upper Egypt, we have the Octawad or the Eight Gods, while in Lower Egypt, we have the Ennead or the Nine Gods, and this will be their story. So, in the beginning, there was Nun, nothingness. Then there are a mound of earth arose from Nun, the primordial waters. Atum, the creator god, created himself, and then he either uh, entertained himself or spat out uh, Amun, Amun or Amun Ra, as he would be later known, Atum, but he created, not to be lonely, Shu and Tefnut, the air and the moisture. Shu and Tefnut then gave birth to Geb, the earth, and sky god Nut, or Nut. Geb and Nut then birthed Nephthys, Horus the Elder, Osiris, and Set. So these are the nine gods of the Ennead. And this is the, and they were birthed at Heliopolis, this sacred creation mound, the nine. So the gods were birthed there, and as the stories say, they would come back to Heliopolis uh, occasionally to arbitrate uh, disputes and to chat and talk, but Heliopolis, Lower Egypt, the land of the pyramids, the Ennead gods, this mound and from these primordial waters which so closely reflects the annual flood cycle and the necessity of building towns and their cities on mounds, also similarities between these natural hills which created the, uh, many of these original pyramids and the Ben Ben stone. Uh, in the description, I'll link a video by Ninth Heretic, why Aardvark is a set animal. There are many, no one's really sure whether Set's a composite or but one of the, you know, he's, he's, he's clearly an Aardvark, he's not a dog in some descriptions. So I think that's a very interesting video to look at because of the importance of the Aardvark uh, across that region of the world. And also she's done a series on primordial mounds, ant mounds, termites, snakes, mushrooms, uh, how important this is in Africa and across the world actually and so the connection between mounds and and also aardvarks as well is a very interesting one. So those, uh, I'll put the aardvark link in the description and also the primordial mound uh, stories in there as well because there's quite a bit in there I think it's very very interesting so those links will also be in the description but back to the concept of the flood the annual flood cycle and the necessity to build towns on mounds so whether it was Bubastis, Heliopolis uh, all the others they were either such as Karnak were walled or, they were, or such as Elephantine were on a natural island which was also on an elevated mound this was just a necessity, uh, man, it's so, but also links very closely to these uh, very old stories, especially as referred to in the Pyramid Texts and Coffin Texts and the Book of the Dead. So it's not just the pyramids that are all pointing to Heliopolis, it's also the texts themselves. And so Atum or Amun-Ra, Re, the sun god, a very, very important, of course, story, especially in Lower Egypt, the land of the pyramids. So... Let's look at the pyramid text and look at uh, pyramid text of Unas, for instance. And it begins with, The hoas grow aroused, the heart of those who cleanse the breast become fully uplifted when they swallowed Horus's bright eye that is in Heliopolis. Now this image as well shows, that, so firstly we see Arket, the flood season, which reflects the summer solstice and the pyramids themselves. Uh, the interpretations of the pyramid text and translations, I will get in, into that because... That's, I think it's a very important issue. Su Susan Bryn Morrow has really been uh, butting heads with the uh, traditional views in regards to what the pyramid texts mean, but the, the hoas grow aroused. So, well, we have hoas and they're quite clearly aroused. And so this represents also the fertility related to the flood cycle, Arket being that the name of that particular, of the three seasons, Arket, um, Peret and Shemu. The Arket's the flood season, Peret is the emergent season, season of growing, and Shemu is the dry season or harvest. But there are many other references to Heliopolis in the pyramid texts, and the kings 
clear and well, essentially everyone, so even the Coffin Tex and the they wanted to connect themselves to Heliopolis. Even in Lower Egypt and Thebes, it was so important to connect yourself to Heliopolis. So in your identity of the Heliopolitan, enduring in his necropolis, he will live, and this Eunice will live. He will not die, and this Eunice will not die. Another passage. You shall evolve with your father Artum. You shall go high with your father Artum, and you shall raise with your father Artum and release needs. Head to not the sky, but the, the Heliop, Helio, Heliopolitan in the sedan chair go forth and part your path through shoes, bones, and then inside your mother, Nut, arms may encircle you. Another passage. Do my command. You who hate sleep, but were made slack. Stand up, you in Nedit. Your good bread has been made in pay. Receive your control of Heliopolis. Another passage, for judgment between orphan and orphaness has been made for Eunice, the jewel mutt heard. Shu was a witness, and the jewel mutt commanded that Geb's thrones serve him, and that he raise himself to what he wanted, that his limbs that were in secret be joined, that he unite those in Nu, and that he put an end to contention in Heliopolis, because Heliopolis, the gods, were born from there, and in times of dispute they would return to Heliopolis. These are not the only passages. For instance, the sky has been bled and Sophus or so, uh, Sirius lives. Sirius, in the past, the helical rising, Sirius would disappear for 70 days and then would re-emerge just when the summer solstice happened, the Egyptian New Year in the flood cycle. So Sophus lives for Eunice, is a living one, and Sophus's son, for whom the jewel Enyad have cleared the imperishable striker, Eunice house for the sky will not perish. Eunice's seat for the earth will not end. People have hidden. The gods have flown away. For Sophus has flown Eunice to the sky amidst his brothers the gods. Nut has, spared, has bared her arms to Eunice, the two foremost bars of the bars of Heliopolis, who spent the night making the gods bewailing, have knelt down at the sun's head. A recitation. There is a Heliopolitan in Eunice, God, for Heliopolitan is in Eunice God, there is a Helio, Heliopolitan in Eunice Son. Your Helio, Heliopolitan is in Eunice the Son. The mother of Eunice is a Heliopolitan. The father of Eunice is a Heliopolitan. And Eunice himself is a Heliopolitan, born in Heliopolis when the sun was above the jewel Enyad and above the subjects. The, uh, Heliopolis was where the Ishid tree was where the royal records were kept uh, by Sheshat, no less. Now, Eunice has come to you. It is in Eunice, wild bull of the savanna, a big-faced bull who comes from Heliopolis. The importance of the bull will, will be uh, emerge shortly because that relates to Sheshat, stretching the court ceremony, architecture, archaeoastronomy, and these other pyramid and other parts of the pyramid texts as well. But Heliopolis was ever ever so important, but it's because it's not a big generator of tourists uh, for tourism. There's no the the, col the obelisks have all been moved, the temples have been destroyed, the walls and temples have been dismantled, and were the primary source of stone. Uh, definitely, the casing stones from the pyramids were used, but they're on the other side of a river. Before they had to go to those stones, they were using Heliopolis as a primary source of um, stones for reuse in. But also another very important passage towards the end of uh, Pyramid Text of Eunice. Oh, you back-turning star, Eunice does not have to give you his magic. Back-turning star is reminiscent of of Venus, uh, which I couldn't say for certain, but also in the uh, story of Inanna and the connections between Venus there. But anyway, Eunice will sit back to the swept area in Hel Heliopolis. Eunice will be taken to the sky. Eunice has come here in advance of the Flood's immersion. Eunice is Sobek, green of plumage, with alert face and raised four, the splashing one, who come from the fire and tail of the great goddess in the sunlight. Eunice has come to his canals in the Flood shore in the great immersion, to the place of rest with green marshes in the Arquette, that Eunice might make green the vegetation on the Arquette's shore, that Eunice might get the faience blue, of the great eye in the marsh's midst that Eunice might receive his seat that is in the Arquette. Now, Arquette is the flood season. 
the references um, most uh, the dominating interpretations of a pyramid text make it a purely spiritual exercise devoid of any um, science or the natural cycles but of course in the field of reeds or marsh of reeds which was the afterlife the flood the, emer uh, the emergence and the dry season were a reflection of in death it was a reflection of the living world and so I'll put um, James P. Allen's interpretation of the pyramid text and his translation he strongly resists uh, this reinterpretation by Susan Bryn Morrow who's shown the archaeoastronomy natural cycles so ever lovely beautifully connect to these to the pyramid texts uh, he refers to Arket and Ark as a purely spiritual sense but even words such as canal immersion blooming themes which are so strong in this particular uh, in the pyramid text in general are actually words related to Arket uh, in in the older hieroglyph dictionaries as well so uh, that will be for future episodes. I'll go, I want to go through the pyramid texts and the comparisons and archaeoastronomy and architecture findings more in detail. But uh, reading these texts through that lens, that they make a lot more sense compared again with the architecture and the other texts and the imagery than, than what does the standard view that it's purely a book of magic spells to go into the afterlife. And the afterlife, of course, is a reflection of the living world, the three seasons, beginning with the flood. So I'll link this, but for instance, this is in the preface of James P. Allen's Pyramid Text. And for instance, when he refers to um, Arquette and Carr, well, I'll, I'll put that, I'll do that more in the future, but you can pause and read this, these articles and how James P. Allen is very resistant of, he calls it a work of amateurs and serious misrepresentation of a pyramid text. I would argue that, well, that uh, it goes the other way because um, okay that's a separate topic I'll get to that more in the future so was it a, a religion with science or versus pure religion well you look at the, the, the architecture of ancient Egypt they knew what they were doing they were a, a, a reasonable uh, intelligent mathematically geometrically educated astronomy educated people and to say that it's pure religion I think it, well I think it's that's really is something that needs to be put to the side especially in on the basis of this uh, more recent discoveries and a more of an interest in archaeoastronomy and an examination of the architecture of the techniques the geometry and, and metrology built into not just individual pyramids but the pyramid complexes as a whole and how they even relate back to Heliopolis and these long distance alignments so yes the pyramids pointing to Heliopolis, the pyramid text reinforcing the importance of Heliopolis and the other important part of Heliopolis was that it was the primary sanctuary of the goddess Sheset, the goddess of wisdom, the goddess of knowledge. All scholarly interests were, were Foth and Sheset. Foth gets a lot of attention but Sheset was the female counterpart and she was at least his equal and in many ways he's superior. For instance, when Foth did a count of the Pharaoh's uh, war prize, she would double-check his counting. She invented writing, Foth taught it to humanity. And the importance of this particular symbol in regards to architecture and survey also is a very important feature. So Foth, can, uh, well, Sheset translates to she who scribes. She invented writing. Here she even instructs folk. This is from the Temple of Seti the First, and there are so many beautiful hymns. Uh, I will get to that in the future. Uh, the the cults of Sheset, I say, pursue, uh, persisted much longer than than is generally um, accepted. When she otherwise she'd become less important, and 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 was folk become the dominant one. Well, I would say that there was actually a uh, something like a Pythagorean number cult built around Sheset that persisted long after that and they hid some very important uh, metrology and understanding of the earth in plain sight. But Sheset, she of seven points, she who scribes. Now there's actually eight points there because the uh, the trunk or the, the branch here forms the eighth. 
Shess, its name translates to she who scribes, so one of her titles is also the Lady of Letters. Now also in the imagery you'll see her with a tool, this is the scribe's tool, the, the ink would be stored there and then mixed on these plates and that was the stylus or the writer. Now we will, this is a very important image, we'll come back to this. Uh, so, so often she's seen writing and oh, there's something in plain sight there. Uh, goddess connected with accounting. Uh, so, for instance, she would even take count of captives, animals, war prizes, won by the pharaoh. So, therefore, she's connected with mathematics. Very strong connection with astronomy. Goddess of astronomy, of geometry. Uh, mistress of a house of architects, one of her titles. So, goddess of surveying as well. Foremost of her builders, one of her titles. So, all building, all construction relies on geometry, math, weights and measures, the economy as well, and these are all in the area uh, controlled uh, by Sheset or the, her male counterpart, Foth. Gods, goddesses, weights and measures. They're, that's the essence of science now, and it was the essence of science of economy uh, as well, so economic science, all that whole area, math, geometry, astronomy, construction, all relates to Sheset. Now, also, houses of life, that's the hieroglyph for it, she was in control of them. Houses of life were schools and libraries, but they also just gave general instruction as well, and one of her titles, Mistress of the House of Books. She was the goddess of record-keeping. Not just the royal records on the Ished tree at Heliopolis, but also libraries in general. That was where she was linked to scribes, of course, being... Um, so she recorded the life of the pharaoh. Uh, also, the time allotted to by the gods would be written on the Ished tree by uh, the um, sacred acacia tree uh, of Sheset. And also, for instance, the high Heliopolis was the primary sanctuary of Sheset. The high priest of Heliopolis was called the chief of the observers, the astronomer royal in more modern terms. Uh, the legendary architect Imhotep, who was often in later times considered to be like an embodiment of Foth, he was one of the high priests at Heliopolis, and that was a primary sanctuary of Sheset, making it so important. Uh, okay, so now we'll be looking at Mesketu, um, the northern star. I'll split that up for the moment, and I want to put that in two pieces because it's running a little bit long. Um, I want to keep it a little bit shorter. Uh, Next part will be up soon, uh, SGD, Sacred Geometry Decoded. Links to the mentioned videos will be in the description. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out, there's a PayPal account, account SGD, Sacred Geometry. You can uh, make small or large contributions as you want, or even just well, keep doing this all the same. But thank you. Thank you for watching. Have a good one. Uh, part 2 will be revolving around... Again, the pyramid text, coffin text, and book of the dead, but the Mesketu or the northern stars, how that applies to architecture, and also the hidden in plain sight connections between this astronomy and the opening of the mouth ceremony. Thank you for watching. More to come on this little offshoot series.